So we're going to start uh, the first day with kind of a general introduction to statistics, you might say, uh, just to get an idea of you know what it is that statistics does and why we might be interested in it. And a lot of you are probably very familiar with these sorts of headlines. You hear this every day in the news or online, right? Uh, all of these interesting statistics. But the reality is that statistics is actually a lot more than the little blurbs um, that you see or hear about in the news. And really in a kind of general sense, statistics is how we learn about the world from data. And it's very easy to understand because it's very similar to the scientific method. In other words, you know, we collect data, we, we, we form hypotheses, we collect data, and then we make decisions. Okay? One major difference is the areas that both apply. So the scientific method is relatively restricted to the natural sciences, whereas statistics, you can see, it's used in you know, engineering, business, medicine, social science, um, what some people call the soft sciences, okay, and industry. But both start out the same way. We form some sort of hypothesis or have a question. We go ahead, we you know, perform an experiment, collect data. Then we analyze it, and how we do these steps is going to be a little bit different. And finally, we draw a conclusion about our original hypothesis. And then, of course, based on the results, you know, we may go back, we may reformulate our hypothesis, ask a new question, look at different things, whatever. So really, in a general sense, you, know, you can think of statistics as a sort of methodology to collect data, to organize it, and then to analyze it for a purpose. And that is, we're trying to solve a real-world problem. So this is kind of a, a kind of general sort of definition that a lot of people give of statistics. Now, the history of statistics, you can kind of see by just looking at all the things that have been done with statistics and kind of echoing that previous slide, um, it, you know, it really applies to so many fields. And there have been a lot of landmark um, historical studies that statistics has really contributed to our understanding of, uh, you know, science, business, medicine. And right now, really, statistics is kind of on the forefront of artificial intelligence, understanding big data, data mining, all of those things that are really kind of hot topics and are, are going to definitely affect you uh, down the road. So let's kind of understand how it is we think about things statistically. And this is going to be a challenge that we're going to come back to over and over again in this course. Um, the beautiful thing about statistics is that it's not mathematics. I know it's weird because you're, te you're taking this class where in a math department, but it's really more like a logic. And so a major goal of this course is going to be for you to understand the logic. And the good news is it's very easy to understand. Once you're kind of told what's going on, you see the logic, it makes perfect sense. So the first thing about statistics is we always start with a question. Like I said, it's not mathematics. It's very, very applied. And so let's go ahead and look at something that relates to us. That's always most interesting. Let's look at a problem involving Lake Lowell. Okay, so Lake Lowell is um, in uh, a national park that was established back in 1909. It's about eight miles from the College of Idaho. And even though it's a protected wildlife area, uh, you're still allowed to fish. So this raises an interesting problem because I'm sure most of you are aware that there are a lot of heavy metals in fish, particularly mercury, that in high concentrations can be dangerous to your health. And so people have set these guidelines. They say basically if you intake more than 60 micrograms at one setting, that can be dangerous for you. And so here's our question. We want to know, is the average amount of mercury in the fish from this lake greater than 60 mil, uh, micrograms? Because then you know, we might have to do something. We might have to look at the pollution that's coming into the lake, give advisories to people, things of this sort, okay? So this is our question starting off. Now, one of the things we have to do in statistics is important is we have to define our problem a little more carefully. We really have to define three things. So first we have this notion of what's called an observational unit. And an observational unit are the individual things that we're actually making the measurements on. It's the things that we're collecting the data from. So 
So let's kind of look in our example. What are the things that we're collecting the data from? Is it Lake Lowell? Is it the amount of mercury in each fish? The individual fish in Lake Lowell or all the fish in Lake Lowell? Well, the things that we're taking the, the actual data from are the individual fish in Lake Lowell. Okay? So these are the, these are the things that we're getting each piece of data from. The next thing we're going to look at is what's called a random variable. And this is kind of a strange term because you're used to variables in mathematics and these are a little different than the sort of variables you see in algebra. And basically the way we can think of them is that these are the characteristics we're going to measure in each of our observational units. And the reason why it's called random variable is it's kind of like that phrase from Forrest Gump. You know that phrase that says life is like a box of chocolates. We never know what we're going to get before we, we taste it, right? Same sort of thing. The randomness is that uh, we don't know what we're going to get. We don't know the mercury level we're going to get from a fish until we measure it. Okay, so it's a variable, something we're interested in, but it's random because we don't know what we're going to get until we actually take the data. So what is our random variable here? Okay, and if you look at the, the choices, really the, the thing that we're, that we're measuring in each, in each observational unit, each fish, is the amount of mercury in each fish. The last thing is we have to define what's called a population. Some people call it a target population. And it's basically all of the observational units we're interested in. Okay? Now here, this is going to be all the fish in Lake Lowell. Okay, so these are all the observational units, all the fish here in Lake Lowell. Okay, so now let's see, to answer our question, okay, let's suppose we were uh, an omniscient being, okay, and we knew the mercury levels of all the fish. And suppose we had five fish, so we're an omniscient being. We know how many fish are in the lake and we know the mercury levels. So here's our fish labeled one through five, and these are the mercury levels. We could actually find the average in the population, right? Be easy to do. We know an average, we just add things up and divide by the number of things, right? So we add up all these mercury levels, we have five of them we get 58 micrograms. And we know the answer to our question. Okay, we would know for a fact that the mercury level was the average mercury level in the population was really below 60 micrograms. But here's the problem. We can't actually get that. And so we have to be a little careful here. We have to distinguish between what we're going to call parameters and statistics. Okay. So we sampled all the five fish, being an omniscient being. But this thing is actually called a, a parameter. This thing, the population average, is a parameter. And, and what that means is that's a characteristic of the population data that has a known value. And so if we were omniscient, we could know its value. But in general, we don't. We don't know how many fish are in the lake. Okay. And we don't know the don't know their mercury levels either until we make the, the measurements, right? And it's kind of important to realize that the population average is not the only parameter. There's lots of parameters we can look at. Nothing special about the population average. We could have also looked at all of the fish and asked what is the what is the maximum amount of mercury, right? That's another characteristic of the population data. So that also would be a parameter. And that's that, that would be really useful, wouldn't it? We could also what is, ask what is the most commonly occurring amount of mercury in the population, which isn't the same as the average, right? And these are all parameters too. So from a statistical thinking point of view, we have to realize that the questions we're asking are always about a parameter. That's a very important point. Let's go, so go back to our question, right? Is the average mercury in the population greater than 60 micrograms? See, we're asking a question about the parameter. We're saying, is this parameter value greater than a certain number? Okay, so what do we do? Well, it turns out that samples are the solution. Okay. But it's also important to realize that, you know, we, we can't get at this population parameter. Okay. Why can't we? Well, very often because we can't access everyone in the population. Sometimes the population is too large. Sometimes we just can't find everyone in the population. That's certainly the case here, right? I mean, there's no way that 
we could be absolutely sure we have all the fish in the lake. That would be really difficult, wouldn't it? And sometimes you actually don't want to sample the whole population because when you take the measurement, it might be invasive or it might actually destroy the observational units. And this is exactly the case with the Lake Lowell example, right? I mean, how do we get the amount of mercury in each fish? We have to kill it. So if we, if we measured the mercury in every fish, we would kill all the fish, which you know, certainly we don't want, okay? So the, the idea is that our solution is gonna be not to look at the population, but to look at a little chunk, the, a sample. Okay. So we can't get the average amount of mercury of all the fish in the population. Okay. We could, but we, we, we definitely wouldn't want to. So our solution is we're gonna look, take a little chunk of the population, a sample. Kind of like when you go to a store, right? and the person has this pizza that when I advertise, they don't give you the whole pizza, right? They, they give you a sample, a little chunk of that, okay? And the idea is that we're going to measure the amount of mercury of the fish in our sample, and then we're going to compute the average mercury level for the fish in our sample. Now, why is that a solution? Well, here's kind of the idea of what we're thinking about statistically. If we take a good sample, meaning that our sample is representative of the population, okay? It's like the population. It's kind of like a mini-me. It's like the population shrunk down, okay? If it's like the population, then it has, it has properties like the population too, right? Which means that the sample average should be like the population average. It should be a good estimate, okay? So the idea is that the sample average should be close to the population average. And that's what an estimate is, right? It's a number that's close to the real number. If you go to your garage and you ask your mechanic for an estimate and he says $300, if it's 280, that's a good estimate, right? If it's 3000, that's a bad estimate, okay? So an estimate is something that's close to the true value, which here is the population average, okay? But it turns out that samples aren't totally the solution. They're the solution, but they're a partial solution. And here's why. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off by looking at all of our fish. Okay, so here's all of our fish numbered 1 through 5. These are the mercury levels, right? And this is the population mean. Notice that there's variation in the population. What do I mean by that? I mean that the mercury levels, they aren't all the same, right? The values vary. Now let's do a little thought experiment, okay? We're going to be an omniscient being again. Let's suppose we could look at all the possible samples of two fish. We're going to call these samples of size two. And we're going to take the sample average from each of those samples. So this is kind of a weird thing, okay? So notice that the first sample of two fish we could take is one and two, right? Then we could take one and three, one and four, one and five. We've used up all the possible samples of size two with one, and then we do the same thing for two, three, and then four. And we compute the average for each of these. So one and two have 50 and 54, so their average would be 52, and we do that for all of these. And notice something really interesting. We know what the true population average is, it's 58. But most of the sample averages are not the same as the population average. And so that's a problem. Because if the sample averages aren't the same as the population averages, how can we make a decision, right? And of course, we're seeing this variation because the variation in the population causes variation in the sample averages, right? So these two have the two lowest. They give us a very low sample average. But there's variation. There's some that are very high. So they give us very high sample averages. So what is the solution? Okay, notice some of these, if I, we had them, and we just went purely off of the value of the sample average, we'd say, okay, for these samples, yeah, we would conclude that the average was below 60. And for these, we'd claim it was greater than 60 or equal, right? But we can't think that way. We have to take into account one thing, which is this variation. How is this variation potentially affecting these values? So how we do that is really quite a process. 
we're going to spend a lot of time in this course talking about this. And it's a general method known as statistical inference. Okay. It's how we take data and make generalizations about the population when we know the data is not the same as the population. Okay. And so the, the, the trick of doing inference is we have to take into account that there's this variation when we're making decisions about the sample, sample data. So how would we use statistical inference in this problem, okay? So here's what we do. We start off by assuming what it is we're trying to show. It's kind of like a logical argument. So let's start off by assuming the population average is below 60. And what we're going to do is we're going to collect evidence to try to show that it's above 60, okay? So in the absence of any evidence, we would assume that it's below 60. No one's proven otherwise, right? So now we're going to collect evidence to try to show that it's above 60. How would that work? Well, let's go back to our samples of samples for a minute. Okay? So we want to know if the average amount of mercury is greater than 60 micrograms. And here are all of our sample averages. Okay? This was the first sample, the second. Okay? This was the third and the fourth. There were two values here. Okay? And this was the last sample of size 2. Okay? So these are the averages from all of the samples of size 2. And here's kind of our thinking. These samples here, which they corresponded to these values right here, okay, they're not evidence that would convince us the population is greater than 60, right? So based on these, we would say, oh, the population average is going to be 60 or below. Now, notice that this value here of 60 is really interesting. It's right on the cusp, right? But what we're going to say is that it's not strong enough evidence. Because we know there's variation, right? Just by random chance, we could have got a value that was just maybe a little bit higher. Even though the average is below 60, we know that there are some samples that are going to be above 60. So we could say, well, just by random chance, we happened to get this one that was 60. It's pretty likely, right? So we're going to say this isn't strong enough evidence. Now, these are kind of tricky. Because notice that these could possibly be evidence that the population is above 60. And the question we have to figure out is, is it far enough above 60 to convince us that it couldn't happen by random chance. Okay. So this is going to be the sort of questions we're going to be looking at. So we're going to have some measure of how much variability there is in the population. We haven't talked about how to do that yet. But once we have some measure of how much variability is, we're going to be able to make a decision as to whether these differences could occur by random chance or not if we got one of these two samples. Okay, so here's something to think about. And so this is, this is a little confusing. We're not used to thinking this way. But this is kind of the logic. We take a sample. We look at it as evidence, okay, for the question that we're asking. And then we have to make a decision based on whether or not we could have got that piece of evidence by random chance, or if there really is a statistically significant um, you know, effect going on. So here's some things to think about along the way. One of the things that's very important to understand about statistics is that we do not prove anything. Notice the word I'm using, evidence, I'm not using the word proof. And the reason why is we know that it's always possible, by random chance, to just draw some freak sample by strange luck that's very different from the population. So we never know that that couldn't happen. It's possible that all the fish could be 59 except two fish that were 68. And we could get that weird sample with those two fish that had 68. And we'd probably conclude that the, that the um, average was, was above 60. It can happen. So kind of there's a kind of a, a weird consequence of that fact. It's very frustrating. We can never know if our conclusion's right. Okay. Later on, we're going to show that if we happen to get that sample whose average was 64, 
we would actually conclude that the population average was above 60, which is very wrong. However, you notice that it's very unlikely we make a wrong decision. But if you go back here, we have 10 samples, so we'd only make a wrong choice 10% of the time. And it turns out that later on, we're going to see that we can actually put a name on that probability that we're correct. I mean, the probability that we make a mistake, even if uh, the average was below 60. We're going to call that confidence. So it lets us put a degree of certainty on how sure we are we made the correct conclusion. But we can never know for sure. So we're going to later on show that there's we can have a 90% confidence. But we never know if the particular sample we get falls in that 10% or we make wrong a decision. So here's kind of two things that we're going to look at. We're going to look at um, what we call descriptive and inferential statistics. So descriptive statistics is how we're going to take the numbers, we're going to make graphs, we're going to compute uh, numbers from them like the average, the sample average, okay? And these are going to be numbers that are going to summarize the sample data in the same way that parameters summarize the population. And so once we have these results from the descriptive statistics, then we have to make a decision. And that's where the inferential part comes in. Okay, we're going to use what we have from the sample, you know, to make estimates, and predictions, you know, generalizations about the population. So let's kind of look up at, at, at kind of examples of descriptive and inferential statistics. So suppose uh, the average amount of mercury in a sample of 60 bass. So we have 60 in our like now is 64 micrograms. Which of the following statements is descriptive and which is inferential? So the first says, this provides substantial evidence that the average amount of mercury in all largemouth bass in Lake Lowell is over 60 micrograms. So is this a case where we're, where we're summarizing something from a sample? Or is this in something where we're making a generalization about a population? And the answer is it's, 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 it's the latter. This is inferential statistics because we're talking about all of the largemouth bass. Okay, we're, we're, we're generalizing what happens from the sample to all the largemouth bass. That is an inferential statistic statement. Or the other statement says this sample of largemouth bass had an average mercury concentration of 64 micrograms. Well, that's definitely summarizing something from the sample. This is the sample average, right? So this is an example of descriptive statistics. So descriptive statistics only talks about what happens in the sample. Inferential statistics takes what happened in that sample and makes a generalization to the whole population. Okay, so now let's go back. And let's um, look at um, a kind of a scenario again, okay? This is, again, is making the difference between a kind of statistic, a kind of, a kind of descriptive and, a, and, an, and an inferential statistics uh, scenario. So we have a coin flipped 100 times. We observe heads 53% of the time. And now we're going to ask the question, did head, heads occur more often? Okay, And we can answer that. That's a yes, no question from the sample, right? Question two asks, is the coin biased towards heads? Okay, Notice this is asking a question about the population of all the possible results we can get with the coin, right? It's saying some of them are are more likely to be heads than, than tails. We can't answer that. That's a question that is really inferential statistics, okay? Whether we can answer it or not, we'll have to see. But again, this is, this is a generalization. It's very important to make this distinction because very often people will go from an actual true statement, a fact, like the fact that we observe 53 heads, to making a claim that the coin is biased which may or may not be true. 
So we're going to try to avoid making these things unless we really rigorously can justify them. So let's kind of put this all together. This is what I would call the, the, the big picture of statistics, okay? Kind of shows everything together here. So first we pose a question. Is the average amount of mercury in fish from Lake Lowell greater than 60 micrograms? Okay. We can't answer that question because it's a question about the population that we can never totally get at. So we take a sample and we collect data. So this part we've done. Okay. Um, then once we have our data, we suppose we're going to take these two fish, we do descriptive statistics. We compute the sample average and we're going to have more data points. We can do a lot more interesting things, make plots and stuff like that, okay? And then we're going to go to the inferential part, which is, which is really saying these, this information that I have from the sample, is it enough evidence to show what I'm trying to prove here? To, to, to show that this is true. And so in this case, you know, we're going to get an average of 62. So we're going to ask this question, well, is the sample mean of 62? Is it enough evidence to convince us the population mean is greater than 60? Or could this happen by just random chance? And this is going to take a lot of time. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to work uh, quite some time answering this question. It's not an easy question. Now, one of the things that's going to be really important is this idea of the different types of data we can have. And the reason why this is so important is because the way that we do the descriptive and inferential statistics is going to depend on the type of data we have. And it turns out that data can be classified in one of two ways, either categorical or quantitative. So while this looks very hard, it's actually quite easy. Okay, categorical our data where all the characters either represent categories, okay, so we have letters or, or characters that represent categories. So for example, gender. If we ask if we if we ask people what their gender is, the only answers that we have, the, the, the answers are either uh, male or female, right? So the data values are categories in a sense. They can also be numerical values, but they represent really different levels of something. Like, for example, a pain scale from 1 to 10. When your doctor asks you, how are you, uh, what is the pain on a scale from 1 to 10? Um, those numbers aren't really meaningful in the sense that we can't do math with them, okay? We can't take the average of pain values or the difference in pain values, okay? And these really just represent levels. They're kind of like categories, too, but categories that that have a ranking, right? So one is the, the one is the, the, the least painful, ten is the most painful. But they can also be numerical values that are in it that are um, identifiers, like social security numbers and stuff like that. Again, we can't do meaningful math with social security numbers, right? If I take the average of our social security numbers, that number doesn't make any sense. This is really just an identifier, a label, right? So this is what a categorical variable is. Now, quantitative are actually quite easy to pick out because they're always numerical and they're either the results from physical measurements, okay? Anything that has units is automatically categorical. So the weight, the amount of mercury something has, height, temperature, right? All physical measurements all have units, all quantitative. Or they can be what's called count data, where we've counted something like the number of points in an exam number of cars in the parking lot. We can do meaningful math with both of those uh, both of those types of numbers, right? So that's what quantitative means. So let's do some practice and, and see if we can identify uh, what's categorical and what's quantitative. So if we take the height of a randomly selected person, is that categorical or quantitative? Well, height is the variable here. It's a number. It has units. So it's definitely going to be quantitative, right? So we're going to say quantitative because it's a physical measurement. Suppose you look at the inventory of the types of genes in a store carries. So you want to know what type of genes uh, does a particular store carry, and they, and, they, and they give you a list. What are the possible values? Well, you know, stone wash, straight leg, relaxed fit, whatever, right? Those values are not numerical. 
they represent categories. So they're, they're categorical. So we could say categorical. Why? Well, there's a couple of reasons. The first you could say is because the data values, the possible values for the types of genes are words. Or um, you could say that the values represent categories. Either one's fine. Now your bank account number. Now it's a number. So is it quantitative or is it categorical? Well, can we do meaningful math with it? No. It's really an identifier, right? So it's going to be categorical. So it's categorical because it's really an identifier. What about the result of a coin flip? The results can be heads, tails. Well, the possible values we get from the results of a coin flip are words, right? Heads or tails. So that must be categorical. What about the zip code of a randomly selected house? Well, zip code is it's a number, so we might think mm, it might be quantitative, but it's not a physical measurement, and we're not counting something, so maybe it's categorical. Let's see, it's really an identifier, right? So it is going to be categorical, because it's an identifier. Uh, the income of a randomly selected resident. Oh, let's see. This is a number, okay? So is it categorical or quantitative? Well, is it a physical measurement? Yes. You could think of it as a measurement. It's a measurement in units of dollars. You could also think of it as count data. You're counting the number of cents. Okay? So for either one of those reasons, you could think of it as being quantitative.